one of the things I'm known for, my first book I wrote is called Success Left a Clue, because on stage I'm known for giving clues to people. Traveling around the world, I've been able to notice and share the stage with and train some of the top thought leaders around the world. And so I noticed what makes the difference between someone who's successful and someone who's not. And I started putting those into clues in my life. And that's what I've kind of been known for. And I'm currently writing my second book, which is called The Authority Key. Because Richard, have you ever noticed how someone can have the same knowledge or experience as you, or even less, but yet they make more money? And so why is that? Well, they're seen as authority and um, you're not. And so I teach people now through the second book I'm writing, how to not only be seen as an authority, the practical skills, being a podcast host, writing a book, all the practical skills, which is great. But I also do a deep dive into who are you as the person, you know, and we put it into the hero's journey here. Think about, you know, what is it that is your kryptonite that takes you out, that sabotages you? You know, things can be going great. You're saving the world. You're doing well. But all of a sudden now you get crippled. Why is that? So I do a deep dive into the person themselves, the mental, the emotional, so they really understand what it takes to be able to uphold that hero and be able to truly be there of service for other people, part of which is taking care of yourself as well. So that's kind of what I'm being known for now. Heroes are an inspiring group of people. Every one of them from the larger than life comic book heroes you see on the big silver screen, the everyday heroes that let us live the privileged lives we do. Every hero has a story to tell. From the doctor saving lives at your local hospital, to the war veteran down the street who risked his life for our freedom, to the police officers and the firefighters who risked their safety to ensure ours. Every hero is special and every story worth telling. But there is one class of heroes that I think is often ignored. The entrepreneur, the creator, the producer. The ones who look at the problems in this world and think to themselves, you know what? I can fix that. I can help people. I can make a difference. Then they go out and do exactly that by creating a new product or introducing a new service. Some go on to change the world. Others make a world of difference to their customers. Welcome to The Hero Show. Join us as we pull back the masks on the world's finest heropreneurs and learn the secrets to their powers, their success, and their influence. So you can use those secrets to attract more sales, make more money, and experience more freedom in your business. I'm your host, Richard Matthews, and we are on in three, two, one. Hello and welcome back to The Hero Show. My name is Richard Matthews and today I've got live on the line Robert Raymond Riopel. Are you there, Robert? I am here, Richard. Great um, to be having fun and getting ready to have a great connection. Awesome. So glad to have you here. I noticed you are uh, also in an RV uh, and traveling. Where are you at right now? Yeah, right now I'm actually in on what's called Crown Land, so government-owned land, where you're able to just come in and camp and have some fun. We're with family because one of the things about being an entrepreneur is having that balance of time with, you know, why be successful if you can't take time to enjoy life? Yeah, absolutely. It's one of the things we talk about on the show all the time is giving yourself permission to play. Um, I'm sure we'll get more into that. What I want to do is uh, talk real quick, go through your introduction just so people know who you are and then we can get into your story. Um, so you are an international best-selling author, an app designer, entrepreneur, and trainer. You spent the last 18 years traveling around the world sharing your passion. Uh, before we got on the call, you actually said, think of yourself like a Tony Robbins, only shorter. <laughs> Which <laughs> cracked me up a bit. So what I want to find out just to start off with is um, what is it that you're known for? What do you teach? And like, who are the people that you do that for? One of the things I'm known for, my first book I wrote is called Success Left a Clue. Because on stage, I'm known for giving clues to people. Traveling around the world, I've been able to notice and share the stage with and train some of the top thought leaders around the world. And so I noticed what makes the difference between someone who's successful and someone who's not. And I started putting those into clues in my life. And that's what I've kind of been known for. And I'm currently writing my second book, which is called The Authority Key. Because Richard, have you ever noticed how someone can have the same knowledge or experience as you or even less? but yet they make more money. And so why is that? Well, they're seen as an authority and um, you're not. And so I teach people now through the second book I'm writing, how to not only be seen as an authority, the practical skills, being a podcast host, writing a book, all the practical skills, which is great. But I also do a deep dive into who are you as the person, you know, and we put it into the hero's journey here. Think about, you know, what is it that is your kryptonite that takes you out, that sabotages you? You know, things can be going great. You're saving the world. You're doing well. But all of a sudden now you get crippled. Why is that? So I do a deep dive into the person themselves, the mental, the emotional, so they really understand what it takes to be able to uphold that hero and be able to truly be there of service for other people, 
part of which is taking care of yourself as well. So that's kind of what I'm being known for now. Oh, and you're still on mute. And I muted myself, uh, which is, but you know, it's it's good practice when you're in an RV and traveling with the podcasts. But yeah, so so you get you do the speaking, you do the author stuff. Do you also do like one on one coaching or training? I know you mentioned you spoke on stage a lot before the pandemic. You've gone through some transformations with your business. Yeah, one of my passions because I've been blessed to train thousands of trainers in accelerated learning, experiential learning, and I have mentoring students that I bring on every year, and so now. I will be working a lot with them one-on-one, -on -one, where instead of me traveling around the world to them, they'll travel to my home where I have a new uh, training facility that we've just finishing the construction on. And I'll be able to put them on the stage in front of a camera and have them train and then say, stop, you know, turn this way, lift your head, put a pause in there. And I'll be able to work on them as a person to make them more authentic and more present, get them out of their head, Richard, and get them into their heart. So in their connected with their audience, whether it's one-on-one -on, -one -on, -one on many virtual or live events, they'll be able to be in their true power so that they can really move people. That's a, that's a really interesting way to teach someone. Cause that's like, I, like I know how to do that. Um, and, but I don't know how to teach someone else how to, how to do that, like how to be present, how to speak and how to sort of be yourself in front of an audience. Um, and you know, I, I went to school for, um, for preaching, actually, I have a degree in preaching and okay. my, my preaching professor in college, he used to, uh, he used to tell me, he's, he, he's still upset to this day that I didn't go into preaching. He's like, you know, he's like in the 50 years I've been teaching, I haven't had a lot of people who had like the natural skill set that you have. So like, I understand that, but I don't really understand how to teach it to other people. So it's interesting that like, that's your skill set is teaching other people how to, get up and be themselves and speak in front of an audience. Um, I was just laughing with my wife the other day that like, when I'm off daydreaming in my head, I'm generally like putting myself on a stage and writing speeches and like how I would give them and how I would talk through them and like the pauses and the stories and how you tell the story and all that stuff. Like that to me makes me happy. But I know like most people getting in front of an audience is like their worst fear. It's like listed up there with the fear of death. Um, yep. So yeah, so you, you help people overcome that and then sort of be themselves in front of their audience, wherever that is, if it's on a stage or on a podcast or, you know, speaking to their customers one-on-one -on -one kind of thing. That's, that's what you help people do. Yeah. And that's exactly it. And a lot of it comes from, you just described it. See your personal journey. You don't give yourself credit right now because you think you don't know how to teach people to do that, but you just described it person perfectly. When you're daydreaming, what is it that you're doing? And that's exactly then what you show other people to do. And you don't make it any more difficult than that. <laughs> so just just like look, working on putting yourself in your head in that space. Yeah, and, and, and this is where, now think about what it takes to become a superhero. They're constantly living it there. It's what you don't see, you know, when they're saving the world, that's what everybody sees. Mm -hmm. But what you don't see is what's happening behind the scenes, the practicing, the preparation, the, you know, being true to themselves. You know, how, why am I doing this? It's that behind the scenes work that is the hard work that makes what everybody sees as the hero seem to be easy. And they yeah. go, oh, see, look at how amazing they are. And then not realizing, you know, I'd love to be like them. Well, okay, if you want to be like them, are you willing to do what they do behind the scenes to be ready to show up full on? And that's yeah. the big difference right there. And that's like, to, to just bring that right into the superhero movies, every superhero movie has that like hero montage, right? Where they have to go through the, they have to do the training. Like when my kids were just watching uh, the old Hercules movie from Disney the other day. And you know that they got the 20 minute scene where he's being trained by the little goat. Um, yep. And he has to work really hard to get to the point where then he can go fight the monster. And when he fights the monster, everyone knows who he is and he's famous. And they're like, oh, you killed the monster and everything. But, you know, they didn't see the crowd didn't see the years of effort he put in to get to, you know, to become Hercules. <laughs> exactly. Right. Exactly. And, and let's go even further back to the original Schwarzenegger Conan. The barbarian yeah the years of pushing that wheel where you know as a slave and he's pushing it and he starts off young and then as getting older he's less and lesser people are pushing with him and he's becoming bigger and bulkier and stronger until he's doing it all on his own that was his building up to be who he was to then become the hero he was yeah yeah and i know one of the things that always is a is a pet peeve of mine is in the entrepreneur space when you see someone become successful ever you, you'll see all the people around them be like, oh, they've been an overnight success. I'm like, they're not, a, they're not an overnight success. It takes a lifetime to have that overnight success moment. 
<laughs> that's it. 20 years, um, 20 year overnight success. And, yeah. and you know, uh, have you heard, do you know who Psy is? The singer Psy? Um, yeah, the that's the one that, she sang at like the last Apple event, right? The one that's got like the, uh, she wears oh, the no, weird... no. Oh, that's, no, what's her name? That's, uh, no, the Psy is the one that did Gangnam Style. Oh, okay, yeah, so Psy, that's yeah. Sia. We were, they're Sia. very close. <laughs> that's, that's right. <laughs> her name's Sia and she can't, you can't see her. But um, yeah, you can't Sia, see her. That, it, when, you, when people look at the song Gangnam Style and they go, oh, one hit wonder, overnight success. But one of the things I love to do and I encourage all my audience is I love biographies. Mm -hmm. I want to know the journey. I want to know where they got from where they were to um, who they are. And so you take a look at Sia's example, that song, a lot of people don't realize that what the journey was that took him to get where he is and that song actually changed the internet did you know that yeah that yeah. song actually changed the internet it's, the, it's first one song of the, ever... uh, the first songs to become um internationally viral yeah first song ever our first video ever on youtube it hit a billion views no other song or no other video had ever done that before and his original yeah. video did it and because of hitting a billion views he actually made Get this, he made YouTube have to recode their servers because they were using an algorithm that was 1 billion, 200 and some odd million that all big companies were using this string. No one thought anybody would ever get to that number. And all of a sudden as he's building and getting more and more views, they realized if his song, his video hit 1 billion, 200, whatever million, the string, he would crash all of YouTube. So nice. because of one song, he had to redo everything. And so everybody's like, wow, you know, that was a lucky yada, yada, yada. But if you look back at his journey, he was sent to school from uh, Korea to the U.S. to learn to be a doctor or lawyer, something his parents wanted him to be. He had the courage, and a hero needs courage. We know that. He had the courage to say, this is not what I want to do. I want to follow my own dream. And he dropped out of school. And because he did, his parents got upset. They made him come back home because they weren't going to pay for him to be in the U.S. And he wanted to be an entertainer. And for 12 years, he started to, you know, he put the work in, in Korea, started getting to be known a little bit, got married, had twin daughters and kept putting the work in. So all of a sudden, one day he came up with this idea for this song. And even the horsey move, what's known for, where he's doing that little dance yeah. on the screen in the video, that's called the horsey move. He wanted to model a move after an animal. He went through 50 animals of what would they look like moving until they came up with the horsey move. And so all that work is what, then allowed it to go viral. But yet, what do people look at? They go, oh, you had it easy, or you were just lucky, or you know what, you were in the right place. No, he put the work in. That's yeah, how he's able to become the a effort. hero. Absolutely. <laughs> awesome. So what I want to talk about then is your origin story, right? Every hero has an origin story. It's the thing that made them into the hero they are today. Um, and we want to hear that story. Were you born a hero? Were you bit by a radioactive spider that made you want to get into uh, the <laughs> teaching and speaking and authorship? Um, or did you start in a job and eventually move over into becoming an entrepreneur? Basically, where did you come from? Yeah, you know, I, I had the, the kind of dichotomy of my parents were always saying as I grew up, Robert, you could do anything you want to put your mind to and you can accomplish anything you want. But on the other side, what's watching the model is that my parents, that one of their big beliefs is you do whatever you need to do to support your family even if you don't like the job. So even yeah. though they were saying I could do whatever I wanted, I watched them and our family move from town to town, city to city, never staying in any one place because to keep working and supporting the family, they're taking on different jobs because the economy was not good. And so I had this you know, struggle inside of me, this dichotomy. And so when I started working though, I did what I was taught. I started working hard. And if they were, the company was any kind of good pay and it looked like it'd be a secure job, even if I hated it, I did that to take care of my family. Yeah. And by the time I'm 21, though, I've worked for three different big companies that I got laid off and downsized from. And my mind's going, something's wrong here. I'm working yeah. hard. I'm staying loyal to them. But I'm glad I learned the, the lesson back then, Richard, that if I wanted any kind of success in my life, I had to be at the steering wheel of that success. I had to take control. And out of necessity, because there was, we were in an economy that was not good, I couldn't find a real job. I started delivering pizzas for a little company called Domino's Pizza. You may nice. have heard of them. Yeah. And from because of my work ethic, I became a manager. My wife became my assistant manager. And we started doing our condition. We started working hard. 
And we started working open to close seven nights a week, seven days a week. And a year and a half in, all of a sudden we got the news from our franchisee that he was selling his stores. He had two stores. He was selling them, getting out of Domino's Pizza. We started kind of, I got worried because it was like, here we go again. We knew the first people laid off when a new owner came in, they laid off the managers and brought in their own management team. And so in my mind, it was like, now I'm about to get laid off again. We have to go find a new job because both of us are working here. Yeah. And my wife's like, well, why would we do that? And I'm like, what do you mean? She goes, why don't we just buy the store? We're qualified to be franchisees. And I'm like, because we don't have any money. That's what we want, you know? And, and I, um, I'll tell you, one of the part of my origin story that has made me who I am today is I have an amazing, amazing wife. We met when we were 13. We started dating when we were 16. We got married when we were 19. And we just celebrated our 32nd wedding anniversary. And Richard, yeah, don't do the math. Awesome. Don't figure out how old I am, okay? And, <laughs> and because of her tenacity of not thinking inside the box, I was taught you stay inside the box. Don't think outside of it. But she's like, no, let's find out how we can do this. And so we started learning and making a lot of mistakes, a lot of stumbles. But we learned something from each time and we learned, started to learn what to say, what not to, until we now had the confidence that we were actually able to go to our bank. We knew what to say, what not to. And because of having a great relationship with our bank manager, she introduced us to the business manager. And we ended up getting not the funding for the store that we were working in that we wanted to buy. We actually got 100% financing for both the stores my franchisee had for sale. And we got became franchisees. And now it was almost like that, oh, we're franchisees. We're, you know, we were successful. We knew how to run a, a, a store, but we didn't know how to run a business. Yeah. And there's a big difference. And in the first couple of years, we went through a lot of struggles, but we learned. My, my whole mindset was, if there's money in the bank, we must be doing okay. <laughs> and that was kind of the success factor. But when we finally got things caught up and figured out, no, we weren't doing very well, because we weren't taking care of, we thought we could do the accounting on our own. We, we thought we had to do everything ourselves. But as we learned and we stumbled through, we started to get some success. We got it figured out. We started running the businesses. And as we got more success, our spending habits got more excessive as well. And by the time we were franchisees for eight years, we were over $150,000 in debt and going down quickly. And that was kind of like the Achilles heel because I don't know if you've ever experienced financial stress, but to me, that's one of the biggest stress anybody can go through. And because we were in this space, we, um, you know, we had been introduced to personal development. I remember my brother-in-law, he came up and again, not to date myself, but he said, look what I just got in the mail. These cassette tapes from this guy called Tony Robbins. You got to listen to these. And I'm like, I need to listen to those. Right. Cause I wasn't open to it. But as we financially got more and more stressed, we were open to going to a three day personal development training. And we walked in and we learned first of all, why we're in debt. It was our spending habits. Where did the programming come from? We learned all about that. More importantly, we learned to take responsibility. Quit putting the blame on others. It was us that was causing the debt. And then third, we learned how to get out of it if we wanted. And when we left that three-day weekend, we went, we're putting this into action. And that's what most people, you know, heroes are called action heroes. A lot of them for a reason, because they take action. People yeah. that don't have success don't take the action. They, you know, a lot of people left that weekend and went, oh, that was a nice weekend. It just changed my life. Um, how? What are you doing with it? Well, it, it changed my life. It. Right. But we decided to put it in action. And because we did, we were able to actually go from over $150,000 in debt to actually retired completely financially free nine months later at the age of 32. And our <laughs> minds went, yeah, and our minds went, wow, that worked. If this much information gives out result, what would more do? And so for the next two and a half years, we dove in and became students from every master we could. Because I'm a big believer too, Richard, don't just learn one way. Don't just learn from one person. Learn from as many people as you can. And while we were doing that, I found that my passion, my true power, the reason I'm here on this planet is to help educate other people. Because I believed if I could even help, and here's how my dream started. And if your audience gets nothing else, I want them to really understand this. Change can start with one person. See, it wasn't, I want to travel all around the world and I want to empower hundreds of thousands of lives. It was, if I could help one person 
do what my wife and I did, go from being deep in debt to being retired financially free, it would make it all worthwhile. And from that journey over 18 and a half years ago, also, and I've now been blessed to travel around the world several times, personally train over half a, thousand, half a million people um, around the world, and then it, which impacts even more, more, and just doing and living my passion. So that's kind of what's been the journey that I've gone through. That's an incredible story. You know, everything from getting, you know, meeting your wife at 13 to going through corporate to running a running a store and buying the store and going in debt and learning how to actually take that business and turn it into financial freedom. That's a pretty incredible story. And that's like, that's that you get to financial freedom by like my age now, right? You know, a couple of years earlier than I am. And then you've spent the last 18 years um, building an entirely new career in the training space, which is incredible. So you've, you've done the, done the success journey more than once. Um, yes. <laughs> so just out of curiosity, do you, do you see the same sort of like struggle arc the second time around that you did the first time? Oh, always. I, I actually, um, you know, part of the things I teach is something called the four phases of life, which is, and I love that you said an arc because um, when I talk about the four phases, we actually, and, and I'm drawing it for people who are listening, it go, has the up, has the down, and it has the back up because that's how everything in the universe is. It's energy. So it's traveling yeah. in frequencies and vibrations. And what people don't realize is no matter where you at, are at in your life, you're going through these four phases continuously. And most people resist them, and that's why they struggle. But if they actually learn to understand them and embrace them, that's when they can have um, more ease. Even when times are going through what's called chaos, they can actually embrace the chaos knowing it's meant to help them evolve to being a greater person. And if they embrace it instead of resisting it, they'll get through it easier and they'll be able to then grow even more. So yeah, absolutely, yeah. One, always going through things, those arcs. One of the things that I always think about is, you know, we, we talk a lot about the climb up, right? Yeah. And a lot, not a lot of people talk about the other side, which is, is going mm -hmm. down. And I always think, you know, you have to learn to climb up, but you also have to learn how to fly on the way down. Absolutely, right? and absolutely. Um, and, you know, because there, there's always going to be struggles. There's always going to be things that are hard. Um, I have a, a, a travel channel because, you know, we travel full time. Um, and one of the things that I have in our intro video is is uh, talking about um, the texture and contrast of life. Right? Mm. And it's, you know, the, the high highs that you come, that you get to have when you're traveling, like we do with our kids and family, where, you know, we've done everything from... Um, jumping off of waterfalls in Yosemite to standing on the side of the road in the desert with our coach dead and wondering what, how we're going to get to the next spot because there's no cell service and no people and crying on the side of the road, right? We've been in both of those places. Um, and it's part of what makes life interesting and fun is that texture and contrast, right? A lot of people, again, for people who are drawing, it, is they try to keep themselves in the median um, and life's just no fun there. Right. No, and no. It's, it's when you have the big the big swings all the way across, whether it's, you know, the financial struggles or the financial successes or your business, or your travels or, you know, your kids, any of that stuff. It's the the it's everything in between that like that that makes life fun and worth living. Um, and, you know, it, it to, to, I guess, sort of tie it together. It's that whole um trying to resist the bad parts or resist the things that you don't think are, um, are worthwhile, I guess, is you're missing out on, on some of the best parts of life. And, <laughs> and some of the best stories exactly you get to tell. Yeah, because if you think about it, some of our greatest lessons come from what did not work in our life. Yeah. And so as an example is, you know, I, I've been blessed to share the stage with the Dalai Lama, Sir Richard Branson, you know, multi-millionaires, billionaires, some of the greatest thought leaders in the world. But because I was over living my passion at one point, I also ended up in going through two back surgeries and being laid up in bed, not being able to move because I didn't take care of me. Yeah. I forgot, to, you know, I just gave, gave, gave without regenerating, rejuvenating and saying, you know, are you standing properly on stage? You know, I herniated a disc, so I had to go through two back surgery because I was spending you know, up to 12 hours or more on stage a day doing, being at home only on average two days a month when I first started training and mixed with all the flying and not standing properly, that disc herniated. And so all of a sudden the world came crashing to a halt and I wanted to, I, I was going to take a year off because I was also burnt out 
from overliving my passion did end up being three and a half years that I took off because I was burnt out and I had to go through a health rejuvenation. And so some people go, oh my God, that's terrible. And I look back and go, but some of the greatest lessons of who I am today came from that time. It's made me who I am today. And so I look back and I go, you know, would I want to go through it again? No, but thank you for the lessons. And now I know, you know, now I know to um, have more balance in, and and I want to be clear, Richard, when I'm talking balance, I'm not talking everything perfect. Like, Ooh, look, it's, everything's always changing to me. The balance is the adjustments you make the adjustments. So I went from doing 40 to 50 trainings a year, not having breaks to when I came to then do not my passion at all for three and a half years, which was not as bad as well, because now I started going into old negative thoughts, old negative habits. And so when I came out of retirement, it was, okay, I'll do 20 trainings a year maximum, wherever in the world I am. So I still get six months a year to be at home, six months. And how many people would go, I wish I had six months off the year. So I created that reality because I learned what did not work. And for the last eight and plus years that I was out of retirement before COVID is I was doing 19, 20 or 21 every, consistently every year. That's how many trainings I was doing a year. It was 19, 20 or 21 right in there because I set the boundary and I hold to that boundary. And that's yeah. allowed me to go, yeah, this is going to allow me to have the healthy life I want to have in all areas, mental, emotional, spiritual, physical, and financial. Because yeah. we're not just one person. We gotta cover all those areas. There's so many good things in that. Um, but I wanna I wanna pull out one of one of the things talking about, about the the work life balance and that that thing. I, and I, I always hated the the law scale metaphor that people use for that, right? With the you know, the the scales that go back and forth. Yeah. And people think they're trying to get their life into this some sort of fantasiful, you know, fanciful um, like perfect balance. And it's never gonna happen because it's an incorrect metaphor for work life balance. And what the the metaphor I use for people that I think is really helpful, at least it's helpful for me, is that work-life balance is more like a rubber band, right? And a rubber band can be stretched and can be stretched really far, actually. Um, If you stretch it too far, it snaps. You experienced that, right? You know exactly what that's like. You snapped the rubber band. Um, But if you look at the way a rubber band works, um, if you want to rocket it forward, you have to stretch it right? You have to put in the work and the effort and you stretch the rubber band and then you, you have to also let it go in order to move forward. Um, and when you let it go, it moves back to a resting state, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but if you keep stretching it, it'll snap, then it won't go anywhere and it's broken. <laughs> yeah, exactly. um, and so your work-life balance is a lot of times it's more of moving back and forth between the stretched state where you're working and putting a lot of effort and making something happen and pushing the rock up the hill, so to speak, to moving back to the, um, the rested state um, and making sure that you take time to do that to, I, I call it, you know, giving yourself permission to play, right? Because yes, um, yeah. it's, it's something that you have to do in order to be, in order to be successful, right? A lot of things, entrepreneurs think to themselves that recreation and rest is something that I will reward myself with when I do good work. Um, and they don't realize that it's not the way that it works. You have to be, you have to have recreation and rest in order to do good work. Um, and, and that's that's totally true. And think about think about when it comes to money. What's wealth rule number one? Pay yourself first. So why yeah. wouldn't you do that with rest and relaxation? See, most people that get into financial stress is because they go, I'll take and pay myself whatever's left at the end of the month. And there's usually more month than money. So they never get success. And but the moment they start paying themselves first for their financial freedom, their life changes. So same concept with who you are. If you're work, 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 go, 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 I'll rest and play when I have time, you're never gonna have time. But yeah. if you make it a priority, and, and so as an example, on a calendar, now I live by this, okay? I live by the calendar on my phone. And so what happens is the first thing we'll put on our calendar is we will put in the, what we call balance pieces. Time for family, time to ourselves, time, you know, the, the things that rejuvenate us, some exercise. Those go on first. So now we've paid ourselves first. And so we're out camping with family right now. And my wife's already got on the calendar for next month, our next camping trip with family. And so this one here, I put in a little bit of work into it, but the next one, I'll keep it totally clear. Because then the other part that comes in is people go, well, Robert, I'm so busy. I don't have time for all this stuff. 
and what I've learned in a lot of my research, Richard, is people are, get really good at being busy, but they're not necessarily productive. And there's yeah. a total difference there. And so when you start looking at it and say you schedule balance pieces in first, then I schedule in what I call focus time. See, in focus time, writing my new book as an example, I could say, okay, I'm going to go to my office. I'm going to write my book. Eight hours later, I'll come back and I'll go, man, was I busy, but it doesn't seem like I got a lot done. What was I doing in that eight hours? Oh, I was on social media a ton. I was checking my emails. I was doing texts. I was, oh, and I wrote a little bit of the book. But see, if I go from 10 to 11, because research shows that a person can only actually stay focused for about an hour at a time before they start getting dis, um, distracted. So I'll say, okay, 10 to 11, focus time, writing on my book. This is what goes on my calendar next, it's focus times. And now when I go to my office for that hour, because I'm productive, I can accomplish more in about an hour than six hours of being busy. Yeah. And so when people learn to be productive, they find they free up so much more time to be able to have the balance in their life. And the other side benefit of doing that is also that as you're doing the focus time is now you can be more present. See, especially in success. And this is one of the reasons why success gets such a bad name. Entrepreneurs. Like, I love that you call it heropreneurs because one of the reasons they get the bad name is they're like, well, your family pays the price for your success. Everything else pays a price for your success. But let me ask you this question. Have you ever been in a conversation, Richard, with someone where you're there and you're talking to them and, and physically you're together, but you know their mind is somewhere else? Yeah. See, that's not being present. And so people equate that um, a good quality family life is how much time I spend with my family. But most of the time when you are there, you're not because you're so yeah. stressed out about business and everything else. You're not truly present. And what I've discovered is that family and relationships will take um, they'll take quality time over quantity time every day so that if you're actually when you're with them, you're with them. And they know you're present. That will anchor in more than being there five times longer, but not really there with them. And yeah. so that's the other distinction. And so when you put in your balance pieces first, then you have the focus time that allows you to now have the presence so that when you're with someone, you're with them. Yeah. And what's, what's really powerful about that is when you learn how to do that in your life, cause I didn't, I, I was terrible at that for a long time. And I let my, my business take over my life cause I didn't have boundaries and I didn't know how to build that focus time in. Um, and I learned, I learned probably four or five years ago. Um, one of the principles of life is that creativity thrives with restrictions, right? You mentioned boundaries a minute ago, right? When you have boundaries for your business and for your life. And so I remember early in my entrepreneur career, I had um, the only way that I could get more successful was to put in more time. That's what I thought, right? I had to just work harder and work longer and I would get more result. Um, and which led to the whole working 12, 15, 16, 18 hour days um, all the time, like seven days a week, right? Trying to get where I wanted to go. Um, and I read a study in a, in a book about something they were doing with children um, and what they were doing is they were taking them to a, like an outside playground area and it had two sections, right? The door go, opens up onto a concrete pad and then outside the concrete pad is a grassy area. And then outside the grassy area is like the sidewalk and the roads that surround it. And they would strip everything out. So there's no fences, no nothing. Um, and let all the kids out to play. And the kids, uh, when there's no fences or anything, they would just play on the concrete pad because that was the natural boundary that they saw. Um, and that's where they would play. And so they would do the same, same experiment. And they repeated it a lot with several different groups of kids. And they put the fence up around the big grassy area. As soon as the fence was up, the kids would play in the whole area. Um, and the boiled down lesson is that creativity thrives with boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, they go through a whole thing on how that happens. But when you look at anything that people do in creative arts, you know, I'm a photographer, for instance, and the whole world of photography is learning how to take what you see and fit it into a little box. <laughs> right. You have restrictions. That box is your restriction. What are you going to show in that box? Right. Um, and what I learned with my business is that I had to do the same thing with my time. Right. And I, so I started experimenting early on um, with what happens if instead of having unlimited time during the day, if I only have eight hours. Right. I've got to get everything I need to do in eight hours. And my productivity went through the roof. I got more done. And so I was like, well, if I if it works good like that, what happens if I 
cut it. And instead of eight hours, it's six hours. And what if it's instead of seven days a week, it's five days a week. And then what if it's instead of five days a week, it's four days a week. And then what if instead of it's eight hours, it's four hours a day. And now um, where I'm at now, I run two big businesses from the back of my RV while traveling the world <laughs> um, on less than four hours a day, four days a week. Um, and get more done in, in 16 hours than most people get done in 80, 90 hours a week with two different organizations. Um, and a lot of that comes with learning how to do exactly what you were just talking about, which is manage your calendar and have productive focused time. Yep, and, and that's it. And, and you just summed it all up perfectly because that's exactly what it is right there. And I wish they would teach that in school. <laughs> I wish they would We're teach a lot of things there. in school. There's a squirrel down that road. There's a reason our, our kids are homeschooled because they get to learn a lot of those things firsthand from, you know, like I didn't learn those things, but my kids are getting to learn those things, which means I'm pretty sure my son's going to be more successful than I am, like half the age that I was, which is, I think, a cool thing. Um, but what um, I do want to, I do want to bring up the next subject, which is about your superpowers. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, every iconic hero has a superpower, whether it's a fancy flying suit made by genius intellect or the ability to call down thunder or super strength. Um, in the real world, heroes have what I call a zone of genius, right? Which is either a skill or a set of skills that you were born with or you developed over time that really help you help the people in your life overcome their villains, right? And the way that I like to frame it for people is if you look at all the skills that you've developed, you probably have a common thread that sort of ties all those skills together. And that common thread is where your superpower is. So with that sort of framing, what do you think your superpower is? I would say it is I'm able to see in people what they're not seeing in themselves, their gift, and then show, pulling it out of them and helping them really see it for the first time a lot of the time, and then how to own it with confidence, not arrogance. And, you know, when I'm talking to someone and all of a sudden something will hit me and I'll tell them about their life. They're like, how did you know that? How did you figure that out? And so I can do a deep dive into people. That's really cool. So I want to, I want to pull out the one, one of the things you said there was confidence, not arrogance. And I, I've always loved that subject because people mistake confidence for arrogance frequently and they mistake arrogance for confidence. Okay, they don't they don't understand the difference and the difference i think and I'm, I'm curious to see what your 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 thoughts are on this but arrogance is generally masking insecurity of some sort whether or not it's fear of or not really believing in themselves um or actually not having the skill that they're being arrogant about right they don't they don't actually have the skill to back it up um yeah, where confidence exactly yeah, confidence is the opposite. Where you've you've earned the right to stand on the the on on the top of the hill, right? You've climbed the hill. You've done it. You've been there. You've done that. You've gotten the results, um, and um, and knowing that, right, and being able to present that to someone else and be like, hey, this is the thing I can help you with because I've been there. And that's really the difference. That, and that's exactly it. And and it is a subtle line between the two. And sometimes you do have to cross over. And and I'll give an example um, because I've been blessed. To uh, develop thousands of trainers around the world. And yeah. at one point, you know, I, I was doing a five day training, I remember. And, and, you know, we were talking about this before you hit record, it's the work behind the scenes that you don't see, that make a person a hero and make what they do in front being the hero look easy. And mm -hmm. I was doing this training. And at the beginning of training, the first day and a half, it's going through the basics, the ugly behind the scenes stuff that look, if you want to be good, you've got to do this work. And all of a sudden, this one guy, he just gets up out of the audience he's, and he just shouts out. He says, I'm out of here. And right, you know, and I've got 300 students in the audience. And I said, what's going on? You know, and he goes, this is just, this is too basic. This is crap. I'm already doing a million dollars a year. I don't need this stuff. And in that moment, I went into a little bit of an arrogance because, you know, I, I, and I said to him, I said, then sit your ass down because I'm doing 15 to 20 million dollars a year. So obviously there's something you don't know that I can teach you. And all of a sudden he stopped and he looked at me and he sat back down. And at the end of the training, he comes up to me and he's like, wow, I needed that kick in the ass. He said, now I see what's been holding me back is because I just think I have all the answers already. And I'm not willing to learn from someone who's maybe got a little more experience and a little more success than I do. 
And he was just so grateful for it. And that, that's not me to normally go into that kind of a, a zone. But in that moment, it's what was needed. And, I, and whether you say my superpower, I read it in him that he needed that kick. In that moment, I snapped over to then, because usually I won't sit down and go, hey, I do 15 to $20 million a year, blah, blah, blah. You know, but in that moment, I, I owned it. Yeah. And it got him to sit back down. So, yeah. And that is the difference. Like the confidence, I can be on stage and I've honed my craft. And so I don't have to think about it anymore. I don't sit there and have to think, okay, how do I get the lasers to shoot out of my eyes? Right? <laughs> <laughs> I can just sit there and I can turn it on because I've got that confidence in it. And yeah. that's the confidence. But I love what you said because you hit it so well. The arrogance usually comes from um, lack of self-esteem. So they're trying to overcompensate or they're not really good as good as what they're trying to say they are. They're trying to fake it while they make it. That's where the arrogance really kicks in in a lot of people. Yeah. And what's interesting is whether people know it or not, they can read that in someone, right? Oh, they yeah. can see that. And there it is, it, whether, and again, most people couldn't name it or put their finger on it and say, this is why that person makes me uncomfortable or I don't want to work with them. Um, but a lot of times it's that line where someone is in the arrogant spot and not in the confident spot because it's it's one of those subconscious trust signals that people give off um and yep. it's it's hard to nail but when you when you when you understand that like you you can probably see that in people because of your superpower and where they need to help and what they can do to move from one side to the other yeah and, and it's learning the lessons too like when i'm teaching someone to sell from the stage or market from the stage one of my number one rules is never ever ever sell something you don't believe in 100% yourself. Because if you do, then people are going to smell it. They're going to see, they're going to, something in their subconscious is going to be going, there's something off here. And yeah. you could be the, you could be the greatest, slickest salesperson in the world. But if you're just trying to sell something because you want to make a sale, they're going to sense it. And that's, so I'll, that's why, that's my rule is don't sell something unless you believe in it 100%. Because then if you do, they're going to get that as well. They're going to get, yeah. wow, they really, they actually believe in this part of themselves. That's awesome. And, and it's all the little subconscious triggers that are going off in people's minds. Actually, one of the things I'm working on with my son right now, because he keeps wanting to start a business and he's got all these product ideas that he's coming to me with, with like, like little craft things that he wants to make and other stuff. Um, and I keep coming back to him. I'm like, okay, so that's, it's a cool idea. But like, if you sold that to someone, what's the value they're going to get out of it? And do you believe in that value? Right. Um, and, and so anyways, we, we've got a whole stuff we're working on in that, in that area, but that's a, it's an important lesson. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so my next question then is the flip side of your superpower, which is of course the fatal flaw, right? Just like every Superman has their kryptonite or wonder woman can't remove her bracelets of victory without going mad. You probably have something that's held you back in your business, something that you struggled with. For me, it was a lot of things, right? I mentioned already, I struggled with the lack of self-care, which is, you know, not having set boundaries and letting my clients walk all over me and letting my time walk all over me. Um, or one of the other ones I struggled with for a long time was perfectionism. Where I was like, I got, I could just tweak it, make it a little bit better. And then you never bring anything to market, which means it's not perfect because it's not existing. <laughs> so it's a very low standard to hold yourself to um, is perfection. And so anyways, I struggled with both of those things for a long time, but I think more than what is the struggle is how have you worked to overcome it so that people in our audience could learn a little from you? I would say self-doubt has been what's held me back and, and that's um and the way i've combated it surrounding myself with amazing people and you know it's a gift now i give to my students especially that are beginning as a trainer i'll say let me be your greatest supporter your greatest cheerleader until you have the confidence in yourself to own it because yeah. you know I, i've gone through the struggles and i know how like even when i took the three and a half years off I was getting ready to do my first training out of retirement and my wife knows something's wrong and she's like, what's going on? And I'm like, nothing. And she's like, bull, what's going on? I said, well, what if I don't have it anymore? And she's like, pardon me? I said, what if I don't know how to train anymore? It's been uh, three and a half years since I've been on stage. And she looks at me, she goes, are you done with that crap? I'm like, what do you mean am I done? She goes, are you done with that story? I'm like, but what if I don't? She goes, Trust me, the moment you step on stage, it's going to be like you hadn't left. And I'm like, but I haven't. She goes, just let it go. And <laughs> just go over course, yourself. <laughs> yeah, she was right. The moment I stepped back on stage, it was like I hadn't been gone for three and a half years. 
like riding the bike. But that's what I go through, self-doubt. Yeah. It's so a I, imposter so, syndrome. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, you know, I, I used to be a big believer in surrounding yourself with like-minded people. But then a mentor of mine last year gave me a paradigm shift on that. Because basically what he said is, if you're surrounded with like-minded people, well, if those people are complainers, you're going to be a complainer because you're all like mind. He says you yeah. want to surround yourself with growth minded people. And the difference is, is a growth minded person will be the one that will be there to pick you up when you fall. They'll be the ch- there to cheer you on when you're doing well. But they're also going to be the ones that are willing to have the tough conversations with you. Of why are you playing smaller? Why are you, you know, why are you sabotaging? They're the ones that are going to be willing to have those conversations and kick you in the butt sometimes. And so now. I make sure I surround myself with as many growth minded people as I can because I am not perfect. And if I try to do everything, even perfectionism, I love the saying, I'd rather have sloppy success than perfect mediocrity. Yeah. That's how many people don't get started because it's never right enough to get started. And so I'm going to get started and then I'm going to make adjustments from what's not working. Three questions that I, I use all the time, Richard, what's working? Make a list, no emotion. Just here's what worked in that scenario. What didn't work? Make a list, no emotion. Then what can we do different? And that's where the adjustments and the enhancements come in. Okay, well, you know, I designed an app. Version one was nowhere near what I wanted to be. But version two that we're working on right now is going to be so much more dynamic because we learned what wasn't working in version one. And we at least got it out and got it testing. So now we know what differences we want to make. That's fascinating. I have I have an app that I want to get developed that will help support one of the services we run in our business. So that's the thing that's on my thing like learn to do list. But yeah, one of one of the uh, um, one of the phrases that goes in my head on that same that same path is um, from a book I, I read a number of years ago called uh, Launching a Leadership Revolution, and they talked about um, the plan, do, check, and adjust cycle. Right. Mm-hmm. So you plan you plan something, and you do it. Then you check what didn't didn't work, and then you adjust, and then you repeat. Okay. So plan, do, check, that's adjust. That's exactly it. Look, the, the 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 space shuttle or you know rocket going to the moon is only ever on course three percent of the time. The other ninety seven percent of the time is adjusting. And that's <laughs> that's life. That's a perfect example of life right there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and if you don't do the adjusting, a little bit off, and you'll end up in a different planet. <laughs> <laughs> it's like this doesn't look like the moon. <laughs> uh, so I want to flip flip and talk about something different then, which is your common enemy, right? So every superhero has a common enemy. It's a thing that they fight against in their world, right? And in the world of business, it takes on a lot of you know in a lot of different forms. But I like to put it in the context of your clients, the ones that hire you to come in and help them, right? Whether that's on stage or picking up your books or coming actually to your your new facility and working with you one-on-one, it's a mindset or it's a flaw that they struggle with, that you're constantly having to help them fight to overcome. That if you had your magic wand and as soon as they signed on the dotted line, you could just bop them on the head and that would be solved. What is that common enemy that you have to fight against in your business? Procrastination. Think of any business owner, especially when you're self-employed you're not actually an entrepreneur you're a solopreneur and it's so easy now when you're managing your own time to and and this is coming from and i will tell you i since the olympics is going on while we're recording this i am a gold medal procrastinator i am (laughs) so i'm coming from the experience of this i've been on that podium so many times getting that gold medal in procrastination and what i realized is instead of fighting it because what you resist will persist. Instead of beating myself up for being a procrastinator, it's like, you know what? Okay, I know I am. So how can I work with it? And so a quote I came up with a few months ago is, I design my day in such a way that procrastination cannot play. And what that simply means is, I will make sure, because anytime I make a commitment to someone else, I will keep it. So I will make my phone calls, meetings, interviews early in the morning, trainings early in the morning. So I have to get up because if I don't, I'm also a snooze button ninja. I have got snooze, like you talk about stealthy. It's like that snooze button goes off. It doesn't even know where it came from that I've got it turned off. I'm so quick. So if I give myself, if I, something's not scheduled, then I'll sleep in. 
and I give myself, for, you know, and then I'll hit the button and hit again. And have you ever noticed? And I, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, Victor, but the nine minutes. So on my alarm, I've got nine minutes if I hit snooze. The nine minutes between the alarm going off tends to be some of the best sleep you get of Never the whole gone. night. Yeah. Yeah, have you ever known, right? <laughs> so it's like I, I can sit there and it'd be like mm, 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 nine minutes, like me, mm, mm. and and I've got it down. So now I on my schedule, and so this morning my first training was at seven thirty a.m. And so to be ready, I'm up at six forty-five to make sure I'm ready to go that everything's in place because I know that I've made the commitment. I'm going to be up and now my day is going and I'll be good for the rest of the day because yeah. I've designed my day that way. So you need, you need one of those beds that when the alarm goes off, it just dumps you out of it. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Now remember I've been to through two back surgeries. That may not be a good idea. So you, can't get, you, have have, you have to have padding to get dumped out of it. No, but yeah. one, of, one of the things that like my, one of my weird skills, I don't need an alarm clock. Like I have, I have a really, really good internal alarm clock. Like if I'm like, if I want to get up at four 30 in the morning or five 30 or six 47 and 30 seconds. And that's when I want to get up. I will wake up at that time. Every time it's weird. Wow. My wife thinks wow. it's crazy. I don't know how I do it. It's just a thing. So I don't ever use an alarm clock. Never, have, never, have never had to. Um, but I totally understand the sentiment because <laughs> uh, I am um, definitely on the uh, procrastination thing. I get that. Um, and one of the, um, the thing that really struck sticks out to me is like what, what I call what you're doing is setting up psychological barriers or encouragements to success. Right. Yes, so as yeah. an example, one of the things that I do is like I have I have a water flosser that I use to floss my teeth. And if I put that by my sink, I never use it because I don't go to my sink on a regular basis. It's not a part of my day. But if I take it and I move it three feet to the right and I stick it in my shower, I use yep, it every yep. day because right. I shower every day. <laughs> right. And so it's a psychological encouragement to success. Right. You're setting your life up that way. Right. And, you know, I, one of my businesses is called Push Button Podcasts and it's a podcasting agency. Um, and one of the things I'm actually doing a training on right now is how to set up your studio like this. Right. Have a little studio set up. And the reason I teach that to business owners who want to do podcasting is because if you have a simple, easy studio that makes you look good and sound good, that's a psychological encouragement to success. You're going to sit down exactly. and you're going to record more often if it's easy to do, right? If you know how to set it up and it's it's in the place, right? And it, as opposed to, I don't know how I'm going to record. I'm not sure how I'm going to sound like. I don't know what it's going to look like. All of those are psychological barriers to yes. action. So you want to set your life up and whatever it is, right? Whether it's a studio or putting your water flosser in the right place or making sure your appointments are at the beginning of the day, that you have those psychological encouragements to good action and those psychological barriers to bad action. <laughs> that's exactly it. That's exactly it. And that's, and that's you know, I, I think you and I will have a conversation off camera over the next little bit because I'm about to set up my new office as my studio with multiple cameras, the proper lighting, the, you know, getting my sure mic all set up because it's also then my command center for my training room which I, you know, where I'll have a stage and I'll be able to have the speakers and everything, but m all my main nice. recordings will be done in my office. So That's you nice. can help me uh, test market. Cause one of the things I want to do is come up with like, what's that, what's a one-on-one -on -one consultation actually worth mm -hmm. to someone who wants to set up their studio and how we can actually, cause I've done it for several friends and they love their studios now. And it's amazing what you can do over zoom with camera and everything to get it all set up. Right. But that's one of my skill sets, right. As a photographer yep. and a videographer, I know how to do that make it look and sound good. Right. I'm in the back bedroom of an RV with only 36 inches of space and my stuff looks like this. <laughs> right. right. Um, so like I've got that skill set. So anyways, I'd be happy to help you, uh, help you get that set up and looking good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, see, and, and yeah. this is the other thing is look at what makes the Avengers the Avengers is they all have different superpowers that when combined, they make an even better collaboration. And that's yeah. what, uh, you know, when you talk about the growth mindset, that's what it is, is who can be your Avengers? What's your superpower that if, you know, because where you have a superpower, you also have the weaknesses. So mm -hmm. what other um, superhero has a superpower that complements your weakness so that together you can accomplish more and help more people? That's yeah. really, to me, what a hero is. And that's what a really a, a heropreneur is. It? Because if, if you're, think about, again, money. People think being an entrepreneur is all about the money. No, it's about what the lifestyle you can have in all those realms, mental, emotional, spiritual, physical, and financial. It's about how can you have that life you truly want. 
So when you surround yourself with the other superheroes and you benefit because you will be paid in direct proportion to the value you get. So if you find a way to giving more value, more value to people, the money becomes a beautiful side effect. If yeah. the result is not the reason. And then that's what you talk about, a fulfilling life. You talk about the superhero being able to have long term. Why you know, does someone like a Superman last for decades versus a superhero that you know, burns out very quickly? It's all in how is their behind the scenes life set up so they can have that balance. Yeah, absolutely. And I know like one of the things, uh, one of the lessons I work on with my son all the time, we, we do little encouragements um, all the time where we're out living is the whole, you get paid in direct proportion to the value you provide um, is I will point people out when we're everywhere, wherever we're at and have him tell me what's the value he's providing to society, right? Nice. It's sign twirler on the side of the road, the waitress at the store, the person who, you know, when we went to New Jersey and they pumped the gas for you and I have him walk through what the value he provi- that person is providing to society and then what the scale is, right? And then we start backing it out. Um, we're like, okay, so if it's the, the, the waitress at the restaurant, what's the value they're providing? Okay, and then what's the manager and the value that they're providing? And then what about the restaurant owner who, and what they're providing? And what if they have more than one restaurant and how much value are they providing there? And we back that out to, so that he can see the scale of value that happens um, and then how that impacts the, the value that they're going to get back in return for that. And it's one of those things, like it took me forever to see that myself. So I work a lot with my kids on hope, helping them see that because it's an invisible, it's an invisible thing. So you, oh, have, yeah. you have to show it to someone in order for them to be able to see that principle. Yep. Totally. I love that. That's a great thing to be teaching children. That's a, actually, that's a great thing to be teaching anybody. Because yeah. if they see that value, then they can understand, well, okay, I guess I'm making this much because of this. And if I want to make more, then I, how else can I adjust the value? And, and people think, well, that means I have to work harder. No, work smarter. Because I love to help people find what their passion is and then show them how to make money doing what they love. Because like all things in life, Richard, you know, it's not always easy. You're going to hit roadblocks. And so if you're doing something that you hate, but it's making you good money, well, the moment you hit a roadblock, you're going to stop, you're going to, you know, quit, you're going to get upset. But if you're doing what you're passionate about, and the money's a beautiful side effect, if you hit a roadblock or a bump, it's going to be like, okay, keep going. You know, this yeah. is just temporary. And, and you're going to, and you're going to see that you're living that life, waking up in the morning going, oh, I can't wait for today instead of waking up going, oh, here goes another day of doing what I hate. Big difference in life. Yeah. Like, yeah. How many people... It, you know, what you're doing with your family, traveling across in your RV, if more people experimented doing that, they would learn that there's so much more to life than how many people never lived to leave the town they were born in. And that's the whole world, right? Until I became a trainer, I'd never traveled outside of North America. Oh, well, sorry. I went to the Bahamas on a cruise, you know, so I, 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 was, I was getting to see some good stuff. But now, I've learned more tolerance by traveling around the world, meeting all these different amazing people in different cultures. And all of a sudden going, you know, just be, they're the same as me, even though there's differences and it's not one's better than the other. We are all the same. It's just different scenarios. And I look for the beauty now everywhere I go, instead of looking for what's wrong or why are they not as good as me? I look for what's amazing about them. First time in India, it was after a major flood that would have shut any city in North America down for months and months and months. Within weeks, this city with Mumbai was back up and running, even after six foot floods in their streets. And they're up and running. And I'm like, oh, my first thought, oh, it's dirty. But then I took a breath because I'm walking and all of a sudden I went, wow, good notice. Why are you focusing on dirty? And I changed the filters in my lens. And I said, let's look for what's beautiful. And the moment when I did that, I started noticing that there's more people that were smiling and happy with way less than what I have, but they were happier. And I'm like, look at how happy these people are. And as soon as I started looking for the beauty, I saw the beauty all around me. And that's a different lens. It's time to take off. Maybe, you know, you got your flying goggles. Now it's time to put on your uh, x-ray vision. (laughs) (laughs) That's I got my, uh, my color change lenses in these that get dark when you go outside. That's always nice. The transition. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, those are kind of like superpowers because when I put my contacts in, then I have to have sunglasses. So I don't know. Right. <laughs> I think you and I could have fun talking about this for hours. <laughs> so, so my next question for you then is the flip side of your common enemy, right? So if your common enemy is that procrastination that people struggle with, your driving force is what you fight for, right? Yeah. Just yeah. like Spider-Man fights to save New York or Batman fights to save Gotham or, you know, Google fights to index and categorize all the world's information, sometimes much to our uh, detriment. But either way, <laughs> what is something that you, or what is the thing that you fight for in your business, your mission, so to speak? You know, for me, it's authenticity. I believe the greatest gift anybody can give this planet is to be themselves, whatever that looks like. And when you're you, people are either going to like you or they don't. And yeah. if you like, if they like you for who you are, that's awesome. If they don't, that's awesome. Because you know, there's like what eight billion people on this planet, and I look at how, like <laughs> well, yeah, and and I come from you know the world of being a people pleaser of. I look back at how much time and energy I put into trying to make people like me that instead of just attracting the people that like me for who I am, not who they want me to be. And so now for me, it's how I love being authentic and I love teaching people how to be authentic because again, yeah. it's the greatest, I fight for that because I, no matter what it looks like, your authentic you is the greatest gift you can give the world. And there's so, there's so much to that, everything from knowing who your customers are, right? So one of the things that I see businesses struggle with a lot is when a customer isn't a good fit and they try to force them to fit and try to change their products and services or fix things or whatever. And I'm like, that person, if, if they don't like your price, if they don't like your style or they don't like what you're doing, they're not your customer, Correct. right? Correct. They're not your customer and that's okay. It's, they're allowed to not be your customer. There's plenty of people who are, who are going to like who you are, how you do what you do, why you do what you do. Um, and, you know, maybe if you run into a thing where every single person you, you ever talk to doesn't like your stuff, you got to change something. But if it's just one every once in a while, right, <laughs> that's fine. Yeah. It's yeah, fine if you don't I, like who you are. You and I met on Podbatch. And I've yeah. been loving it because I've been meeting some amazing people. And all of a sudden, I get one person respond back and it's like, um, why would I want to interview you? You do this, you do this, and you do this. So why would I even think of interviewing you? And I just said, thank you for responding to me. You know, have a great day. <laughs> yeah, let's move on. <laughs> Next. But I did take it personal for a while because, again, that side of me was coming up like, oh, what am I doing wrong? And then it was like, wait, no, no, no. I've got, you know, 50-some-odd five-star ratings, and I'm the number one guest. So why is this one person that doesn't like me for who I am why am I taking that personal? Yeah. And so I'm always on that journey myself. And that's why I fight for it in other people as well, right? It's because yeah. and I, it, it comes from that. I think one of the uh, the important things too is just understanding how important your perspective is to the value you bring to the world, right? So one of the, uh, one of the things that um, I teach in one of my training courses is something that I call the crocodile infested river. Right. And the crocodile infested river is the levels of awareness of any, any particular problem that someone has that you're helping them solve in your business. Right. So whatever that is, they're going to start off on the left side of that river. Um, and on the other side of the river is the promised land. It's like life after their problem is solved. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, life after the back surgery and your back's recovered and you're back to your normal self again is life in the promised land. Right. And the crocodile infested river is having to go through and actually change your life to fix the problem, right? It's the actual, you know, and all the struggles and everything that goes along with it. Um, and what I tell people is in your business, you are the person who comes along with a boat, right? And that boat is your product or service, whatever that is that you help people with. And your boat's got cool shit on it, right? It's got crocodile um, disintegrating lasers. And, you know, it's got, you know, stuff to navigate the whirlpools and all that other fun stuff. But the most important part of the boat is that it comes with you as the captain. Yes, right, because yes. you've been there. You've been across this crocodile-infested river. You know where they are. You know where the pitfalls and downfalls are, and you can help someone through that because you have the life experience, the story that goes along with with whatever it is that you're doing. And I think people miss that in their business. Is how important their perspective and their value is to 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 what they're doing. Well, and that's the second, like in my book, Success Left a Clue, I outline six steps to create the life of your dreams. And the second step is find a mentor, find someone to model. Because that, that captain of that boat is the person who has the experience. And so if someone's new trying to do on that business and try to get people across the river, as an example, they can have the greatest technology, but if they don't have the knowledge of how to actually navigate it, 
and used yeah. to all the equipment, they're not going to do well. And, and it's a big gift that most people forget to do. They're like, I got to figure it out on my own. It can't go back to that school thing. So, but the moment they go, <laughs> if I can find a mentor or someone to model that's accomplished, unless you're a Jeff Bezos or a Elon Musk, chances are whatever you want to accomplish, someone's done it before you. So find out how they did it. Fine. And, and, you know, but Robert, I'm, that mentor, they're no longer alive because I love Napoleon Hill. Uh, I can't be mentored by Napoleon Hill. Sure you can. Read his books, his book. studies his courses. Look at all the things that he did. And so it's about creativity. Because if you want to get good at something, find someone who's done it, learn from what worked for him. But again, more importantly, what didn't work. So you avoid those mistakes. And by having that mentorship, you're going to get across those crocodile infested waters a lot easier. So I love that. I love that analogy you have. <laughs> it's my favorite one. I stole it from someone else and I've modified it a lot. But anyways, crocodile infested river is one of my favorite metaphors for understanding the progress from, you know, to solve problems essentially. Yep. So I want to talk then a little bit about your hero's tool belt, right? And this is the practical portion of our show. And it's just like, you know, every superhero has their web slingers or batarangs or, um, you know, laser eyes, whatever it is, or maybe it's a big magical hammer that you can spin and fly around with. Um, I'm going to talk about the top one or two tools you couldn't live without. Could be your marketing tools, could be product delivery, could be your notepad, your calendar, anything that you think is absolutely essential to getting your job done on a daily basis. Mm, yeah, well, a new one that just came into that tool belt, I finally, after years, got a virtual assistant. And Genius. oh my goodness, I'm going, <laughs> why did it take me so long? because she has just totally taken over all of my social media and does it and she loves doing it and she's a master and a whiz at it and i struggled with it but i tried to do it right so a virtual assistant is one and and oh my goodness just oh so, yeah um, the second is <laughs> one of the clues i give out is write it down uh, you know i can have a I, I when i walk for my back i love to walk it, it helps lose my back up and i i get very present when i'm present that's when the genius comes in because you're now directly connected, you know, to, mm -hmm. to God, to the greatest power of the universe, whatever you want to call it. And also the inspiration comes through. But have you ever noticed you can also say something, something go, what did you just say? That was amazing. And all of a sudden you're like, I don't know. I can't remember. So it's, I write, I, I'm, I'm methodical. I have my notepad on my phone or a voice message. As soon as something comes up, I don't even think about, Oh, I'll write it down later. I just instantly put it in my notes. Because I know, I know me, I know I won't remember 10 seconds later what the heck it was. And so I, that's another thing in my tool belt is writing it down. Yeah. And then third thing I would say would be loyalty. And loyalty to my, um, number one loyalty is loyalty to my own dreams. And where I want to go, what I want to accomplish. Because I've witnessed too many people give up on their dreams and um, choose early, like that three feet from gold book, three feet from gold. They stop just before they're about to accomplish what would change your life. So those were, would be three things I think that are in my tool belt. So I think all three of those things are pretty genius. I hired my first virtual assistant a couple of years ago now. And I remember sitting down with a mentor of mine, right. To bring some of this stuff back full circle. We were, you know, I, I have a mentor and we were at a mastermind together and, you know, we all bring something to the mastermind. Um, to, you know, here's stuff that we're working on that would be valuable to the group. And after I did my, my talk and like the, our, my give for the, for the week, um, he pulls me aside and he was like, you're doing some really cool shit. And he was like, but you are your own worst nightmare, right? Cause you are your own, your biggest bottleneck. And he's like, you need to fix that in your business. If you really want to scale the value you're bringing. And he was like, what I want you to do when you leave here is I want you to go and hire this person, hire them full time and then figure out what to do with them later. And I was like, I can't do that. And he was like, you can, and you will. And I was like, you're crazy, <laughs> right? But he's, you know, mentor for a reason, right? And, and, and I vacillated on that for months, months going, I don't know how I can afford to pay someone full time to do these things that they should do. Cause it just, it didn't make sense in my head. And it didn't make sense because I didn't have the perspective that he had. <laughs> right? That's, that's right. why you bring a mentor in. And so I couldn't make it make sense in my head. But finally, I just bit the bullet and did what he told me to do. Right? He's like, he's like, you're not going to understand it until you do it. <laughs> um, and so I hired them. Um, and it was almost immediate realizing because what it did was it changed the question that I was asking in my head. 
right? And the question I was asking in my head to myself was, is this worth hiring someone for or should I do it myself? That's and that's a poor person's question yeah. <laughs> um, because the answer was always, I should do it myself because I can do it faster and cheaper, right? Or so I thought. Um, and, and as soon as I had someone else on my team that was a full-time staff member, the question was, what can I take off of my plate and put on theirs? That's right. And when you ask better questions, you get better answers. And it changed my business, right? Changed everything about what I was doing, um, right? So hiring a VA, huge win in my business. <laughs> and, 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 you know, that's something a mentor told me is in your business, you're only allowed to do what only you can do. And everything Absolutely. else, someone else does. And, and I, you know, you and I are obviously so much on the same wavelength. As an example, I, I, um, one of the original titles of my book was going to be three, two, one rich. And because it was a formula and that's have three coaches in your life, three, co it could be a health coach, a business coach. It could be a um, mindset coach, it could, whatever it is. Right. But have three coaches, have two mentors in your life. Now, the difference between a coach and a mentor, a coach is someone who's going to ask you what you want, draw out of you, you know, and walk you through it. A mentor is someone who's accomplished what you want. And they're going to say, do this, do this, do this. And they're just going to tell you, they're not there to coddle you and, and be nice. They're there to say, if you want what I have, do this, do this, do this. And then be part of at least one mastermind. Yeah. Because again, that power. And I love that you mentioned a mastermind. And so if you have three coaches, two mentors, and one mastermind, you will be rich in all areas of your life. Yeah, and I have... Point. I, I can tell you, I have, I don't, I don't know if I could, uh, if I could name three coaches, I probably have two, probably could get another one, but I've got a health coach and I've got a business coach, um, in, in my life. And I've got a couple of mentors and I've got something I, I call running partners, right? People who are in the same place that you are running their own yeah. stuff on the same journey. Um, and those are people that are your mastermind. Um, that's right. And, yeah. And it, those things in my life are probably the things that make me the most successful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. yeah, there's just, there's so many cool things that we could talk about. <laughs> yeah, but it's a good we, thing it's a 45 minute interview. No, I know, 45 <laughs> minutes. We got a little bit long. That's all right. Some of the best interviews are longer than 45 minutes. And now, a quick word from our show's sponsor. Hey there, fellow podcaster. Having a weekly audio and video show on all the major online networks that builds your brand, creates fame, and drives sales for your business doesn't have to be hard. I know it feels that way because you've tried managing your show internally and realize how resource intensive it can be. You felt the pain of pouring eight to 10 hours of work into just getting one hour of content published and promoted all over the place. You see the drain on your resources, but you do it anyways because you know how powerful it is. Heck, you've probably even tried some of those automated solutions and ended up with stuff that makes your brand look cheesy and cheap. That's not helping grow your business. Don't give up though. The struggle ends now. Introducing Push Button Podcasts, a done-for-you service that will help you get your show out every single week without you lifting a finger after you've pushed that stop record button. We handle everything else, uploading, editing, transcribing, writing, research, graphics, publication, and promotion, all done by real humans who know, understand, and care about your brand almost as much as you do. Empowered by our own proprietary technology, our team will let you get back to doing what you love while we handle the rest. Check us out at pushbuttonpodcast.com forward slash hero for 10% off the lifetime of your service with us and see the power of having an audio and video podcast growing and driving micro celebrity status and business in your niche without you having to lift more than a finger to push that stop record button. Again, that's pushbuttonpodcast.com forward slash hero. See you there. And now back to the hero show. So I want to talk then a little bit about your own personal heroes, right? Um, you know, we just, we just talked about this a second ago. Every, every hero has their mentors, right? Frodo had Gandalf, Luke had Obi-Wan, Robert Kiyosaki had his rich dad. Even Spider-Man had his uncle Ben. Who were some of your heroes? Were they real life mentors? Were they speakers or authors? Maybe peers who were a couple of years ahead of you? And how important were they to what you've accomplished so far? Oh, you know, so many to mention. Yeah. Um, you know, I've got my, still my, greatest training mentor, um, you know, a gentleman, and it's funny you re mentioned re Robert Kiyosaki. Um, it's one of his rich dad advisors, a gentleman by the name of Blair Singer, who originally taught me to be a trainer. And then I got to work with him for a lot of years, uh, you know, training other trainers. And, and we actually do a weekly clubhouse together uh, with a few other friends that I've trained. So, you know, he's been amazing. He's one of my heroes. Uh, another hero, probably the number one hero is the person sitting about 
10 feet away from me in another room here in the RV because I will fully admit and have no problem doing it. I would not be who I am today doing what I do today, Richard, if it wasn't for my wife. Because of her yeah. words, left to my own devices, I'd be miserable in a job. But I'd be comfortable, but I'd be miserable doing a job. But she's not willing to let me play smaller than I am. It's a gift that she gives me. And it's a gift that we now give each other because, you know, left to my own devices, I would play small. And so um, she's absolutely another one and in my life. And, you know, so, man, uh, Les Brown, he wrote the forward to my book. He started off as a, a mentor. Uh, then we, I had him as a guest at, at a training. I was doing a five-day training. We became friends. And so now he's a mentor. He's a friend. And I also started becoming a mentor in some ways to him. And so it, it became a good, um, you know, beneficial relationship, win-win. So I'd say those are three people off right off the top. Yeah, of yeah. My, my wife's definitely up there on my list. Different reasons. Um, because really what she is for me, because I'm, I'm definitely not the play small person. Um, like, I'm, I'm the person that's like, I'm going to jump off the cliff and learn to fly on the way down. Um, like that's my whole life. Um, but so what she helps me with is she helps to ground me. Um, yes. And she helps to, um, she helps to really, she enables a lot of the things that I do. Right. Because the reason I have the confidence to, you know, jump off the cliff and learn to fly on the way down is I know that she's got everything else in our life handled. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. she's got the kids taken care of she's got the house taken care of she's got our life handled um, so I can take bigger risks and push harder um, than I would have been able to otherwise so yeah, absolutely yeah. absolutely <laughs> awesome so one, um, I got one last thing I want to talk about right and it's your guiding principles so one of the things that makes heroes heroic is that they live by a code um, for instance, Batman never kills his enemies. He only ever puts them in Arkham Asylum. So as we wrap up the interview, I'm going to talk about top one, maybe two principles that you live your life by. Uh, well, one we've already said, um, loyalty. Actually, both we've already said, and authenticity. Those are the two, you know, because to me, I've, I've experienced way too many. Uh, and you see this in all industries, but in the training industry, when I see someone on stage, who's one way, but then the moment they step off stage, they totally change. Yeah. And it's like, wow. Right. And, and one of my mentors had actually said, Robert, never be afraid to meet your students anywhere in the world and have to figure out who to be. Always be you and be authentic. That way you never have. And I've met my, I've met um, <laughs> students in so many different places, airports, malls, everywhere around the world. And they're like, wow, you are who you say you are. And, and it, it comes back to actually, I hated the word um, when I first started training, the word guru. I hated that word because, you know, it's us that puts other people on pedestals and stuff like that. And a student would call me their guru and I'd call, you know, Ugh. and I was doing a training where I was teaching a full on five day training. At the same time, I was training six trainers how to train that training. And one of my a really good friend who does a powerful piece of the training, he was actually working with my six trainers. And he was going through some stuff with them. And one of the, he asked a question of one of the students and the student said, well, Robert's my guru. Well, my friend is reads body language, reads facial expressions, all that. And out of the corner of his eye, he saw me kind of cringe and flinch. And he stopped and he said, Robert, what just happened? And I'm like, Aaron, nothing, just keep going. He goes, no, you just had a reaction when he called you the guru, why? I'm like, Aaron, it's about them, just keep going. He goes, no, guys, we're not going any further until Robert starts talking. And they're like, yep. Yeah. Hey, Robert, right? He put me on the spot. I'm like, I'll get you back. But I said, I hate that word guru. And he goes, why? I said, because I don't, I'm not better than other people. I'm not, you know, this all knowing person. I'm just me. And he had me do something that changed my life. And I'm going to have you do it for me, Richard. I want you to spell the word guru. G U R U. So I spelled it and he looked at me and goes, yeah, G U R U. <laughs> and in that instant, it was a whole shift. And it's now become one of the greatest compliments I could ever receive. It's That's because awesome. I'm just me. So that, yeah. that would probably be it right there. So authenticity <laughs> that's, and loyalty. That's that's an incredible way to think about authenticity um, and just being who you are. Um, and I know that's, that's a, it's a thing that um, I strive for is to just always be who I am. Um, but also at the same time, knowing how to turn up the dial, 
right, mm -hmm. on your personality. Because when you are performing, right, like we're doing now, <laughs> um, or when you're on stage, something like that, you have to have that ability to turn on, right? And um, and so there's there's a difference between being someone different on stage versus not, and knowing how to turn yourself on and put yourself in the zone. Um, exactly and I think that's that's a that's an important skill to know and know that that's it that it's different, right? It's different than pretending to be someone you're not. Um, well, yeah. So like when I'm on stage, I'm Robert Raymond Realpal, and this comes to my four currencies. One of the currencies is the currency of fame. When I'm on stage or when I'm doing an interview, I'm doing what I do as my brand. I'm Robert Raymond Realpal. I'm me in that brand. But when I'm at home, I'm just Robert or Rob. And so yeah. like when I'm sitting around the campfire with family, I'm not sitting there going, hey, guys, this remember, this is what I do. Here's who I am. Someone go get me a beer. Yeah. If, if I was doing that, it'd be like, I'm going to whop your ass and then you go get your <laughs> beer, right? It's So it's me being me. But like I love how you said, you know, dialing it up, turning it on. Because when I'm on stage, I've got to hold the space for a thousand, two thousand, five thousand students. And so if I just sit there and go, hey, hey, okay, you know, I, I can be me, but I've got to be in that presence, that yeah. energy. And that's that's the present in moment. That's why being present is so important. Yeah. And the 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 second piece there you mentioned, which is loyalty. And I love what you said earlier, and I just wanted to bring it back up because I don't think we we touched it, was loyalty to your dreams. Right. Um, and I know that that is such an important thing. And I have I have told people a lot um, that growing up um, and stuff is that, like, you can't compete with me. And the reason I know you can't compete with me is because I will work you under a table like That's long right. after you long after you've given up. I will continue be continually be pushing that rock up the hill. Right. And that's the difference between someone who's going to accomplish what they want to accomplish and not. Right. And one of the and it comes from something a mentor, an early mentor of mine said to me. Um, and he said um, that we vastly overestimate what we can accomplish in a year and vastly underestimate what we can accomplish in 10. Um, and so he was like, give yourself the time to achieve what you want to achieve, to achieve your dreams, essentially. Yes. Right. Yes. And I know, like, if I go back 10 years ago and look at who I was then, I was a struggling, fairly young entrepreneur. Right. And where I'm at now, I'm world class in every area that I, I work. Right. Which is amazing. But, it, you know, it took a lot of effort to get there. But most people give up before they get to world class. Wait, wait, are you saying you're like a 10 year overnight success? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, it took a lot longer than that. I started my first business at 13, so it's more like 23 or four years. Um, yep. But yeah, it's it's been a long time, um, but it's continually pushing and continually struggling and continually putting off the things that you want to do so you can do what you need to do now. Um, and but anyways, it, it it's it's that that loyalty to where you want to get to. And you know, it doesn't matter how long it takes. If it's four years or five years or 10 years or 15 years or 20 years, right? I know like some of the goals that I wrote down when I was 13, I only just recently accomplished some 23, four years later. Exactly, exactly. And, and that's it, that's such a key there. There's, oh man, there's so many things in that. And, and, and when people learn to be loyal to themselves, but Robert, that's selfish. Sometimes you have to be selfish because if you can't be selfish for your, what you need, how do you think you can be able to deliver to other people what they need when it's yeah. time for you to be on as an example? And, and it's crazy too, because if you look at what I, what, what, um, like my life, the, if you call it selfish to continually push for my own dreams and you look at where we're at now, like the number of clients that we serve or the number of employees that we have, whose families that our business provides for, um, is, you know, like one of the things that's on, on my mind all the time is, you know, we got to make sure we're making payroll because we got families and kids that if we don't make payroll, they don't get to eat. Right. That's right. It's, it's sort of like the opposite of selfish. If, uh, <laughs> you know, when, when you think about what entrepreneurs actually do is they're, they're providing value to the world. Yeah, um, and, yeah, it's a huge key. So anyways, I love, I love the idea of loyalty to your dreams. I might put that up somewhere cause I've never heard it said that way. And I really like that. So, <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, and that's basically a wrap on our interview, but I do finish every interview with a simple challenge that I call the Heroes Challenge. 
And it's basically, it's a selfish thing, right? We just talked about that being selfish. It's the selfish thing I do to find access or find stories that I might not otherwise find on my own. Cause not everyone is out on Podmatch looking to be on a podcast. Um, so the question is simple. Do you have someone in your life or in your network that you think has a cool entrepreneurial story? Who are they? First names are fine. And why do you think they should come share their story with our audience here on the hero show? Oh, you know, and someone I just mentioned who taught me about guru, um, Aaron, he has one of the top facilities in all of North America for helping at risk teens. And his goal is to keep them from having to come to his facility so that he can help them and their families out before they ever get to the stage of attempting suicide or having the drug addictions and all that. And this gentleman, he is also, um, he, oh, he is a Viking true at heart. He teaches sword play to the kids when they're at his facility, he axe throwing, all of that. And he works on the archetypes of people the four archetypes and he's just a brilliant brilliant man in all arenas and the work he does to help families not just the kids but the families of at-risk youth um he, he's just a powerhouse and and i will i will connect him with you because uh he he would just be a, a mind-blowing guest for your audience to learn from you talk That'd about a superhero he looks like a superhero he's aerodynamic like me he's got the big viking you know um beard and, and goatee yeah he's he's quite the guy that's awesome. Yeah. So we'll, we'll reach out afterwards, see if we can, I can get him on the show. Sometimes the guests say, sometimes they say yes, sometimes they don't, but either way, sometimes we get some of the best stories out of those hero challenges. So um, in comic books, there is always the crowd of people at the end who are cheering and clapping for their acts of heroism. So our analogous to that on this show is where can people find you? Where can they light up the bat signal, so to speak, and say, hey, Robert, I'd love to get your help to help become my more authentic self. Right? Where can they um, you know, come to find you? And I think more importantly is who are the right types of people to reach out? Yeah, well, you know, first of all, it's, it's, it's um, being honored to have you ask me to be a guest. I would love to honor that because uh, I feel privileged and to honor your listeners that have taken the time because their time is so valuable as I would love to, they can find me at just robertrealpel.com, my, my name, Dot com so r o b e r t r i o p e l dot com and they can actually what I'd love to do as a gift for from us is they can actually get my book success left a clue the digital copy as a gift they'll be able to download it by going to that to the website and the reason I would encourage them to do that though it does does come with a caveat see I didn't write the book for someone to read and then put on the shelf and make it shelf help and yeah. that's not why I wrote it. I wrote it as a workbook because the third step is take action. So I have action steps all the way through the book. And what I'll do is actually at the chapter beginning, it'll say, did you do the last action? If not, stop reading right now, go back and do the action. And so I would love for people to do take the book, put the action in place, because if they do, it will impact their life. Guarantee that. They can also follow me on Facebook. I have a fan page, um, Robert Realpel. Just put my name in, you'll find my fan page. And that way, as I journey around and do the um, trainings I do, they're able to private message me. I actually respond to it. I don't even have a virtual assistant do that. I love to interact with audience because if I can help someone bring their greatness to the world, even one more step, oh, I just love that. I love that. Awesome. So we will make sure that the uh, link to the book and to your website is in the show notes below. So if you're listening to this, you'll be able to find that link um, on our website. Um, and Robert, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your hero's journey and your hero's story with us today. Really appreciate that. Do you have any final words of wisdom for our audience before I hit this uh, stop record button? Yeah, I just leave it with how I sign every autograph and every book. Always live with passion. Absolutely. Thank you very much for coming on today, Robert. 